Good morning. Lighting candles is one of my favorite traditions in the church. I remember when I was a small child in my grandmother's church, um, the Presbyterian Church in Nevada, Iowa, and longing for the day when I would be old enough to light the candles, to be an acolyte. To me, it seemed like such a special thing to play with fire and to get to do something that the little kids couldn't do. It was a tradition that children only of a certain grade were the ones to light the candles. Tradition is what we're going to talk about today. Traditions that help us to connect with God, that help us to remember who we are and whose we are. But what happens when a tradition hinders people from feeling God's love? What happens when tradition gets in the way of helping someone or embracing someone? What happens when we stick with our traditions and we see the next generation walking away from the church? Then what do we do? We pray and we go to God and we ask God to guide us and say, when do we let go of the tradition so that we can be a community with all people? Let's take some deep breaths this morning and if you have a candle, I invite you to light it so that where you are and the place that you find yourself this morning, whether it's your bed or your couch or your kitchen table, it is sacred space. It may not be a traditional space to worship, but for this time and for this period, it is sacred. Because it is time that you are giving intentionally to God. That you are intentionally making this time and space sacred because of what is going on in your heart. So let's take another deep breath. And know that God is with you wherever you are in your sacred place. So let's worship God.
interesting thing about traditions in Christianity is that for 2,000 years, Christians have changed and absorbed traditions from other cultures as Christians moved from being a Middle Eastern religion born in the cradle of Israel to being a Southern European to then a Northern European to an all of European. And as Christianity moved through the various places, it absorbed and took on new traditions. Traditions keep changing. Christians are one of the most diverse religions in the world because all over the world, people take traditions from their indigenous cultures, from cultures around the world, and incorporate them into their faith in Jesus Christ. The tradition of a candle wrapped in barbed wire came from South Africa, when during apartheid, Christian churches took this symbol, the symbol of the Christ candle from Christmas, the symbol of God's light bringing peace and justice and freedom for all. And churches lit these as a sign of their prayer and their hope that in their time and in that place, there would be freedom for the people experiencing such extreme systematic racism. And so I invite us to think about those who are oppressed in our time, in our place. And as we light this candle, let's pray for those persons that we might stand beside them as we know Jesus is standing beside them. Let us join in prayer for all those who are sick, for all those who have had surgeries, for all those who have struggled, for all those who are grieving. I invite you to think about the people that you know that need Jesus today and need the Holy Spirit to embrace them. Just name them in your hearts. And as you think of those people, as you think of those names and their faces, I invite you to lift them up and trust them to God. Trust that God is at work in and through their lives. And if you have been struggling, if you have been doubting or afraid or struggling with your faith or struggling with hunger or financial issues or stress, I want you to know that Jesus is with you today, that God loves you, and whatever you're going through, you're not going through it alone, because God is our great parent who never leaves us alone, but always walks beside us. And so using the words of Jesus 2,000 years ago, let's say our traditional Christian prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Greetings from the Fireside Room in St. Mark's. If you've never been in that little room next to the sanctuary, it's got a beautiful fireplace and some lovely couches, and it's a great place to meet with your support group or a book club or a study of some kind. I hope that we will be open for small groups really soon, uh, probably next week. Very exciting. I hope that you will pick up your Bible and turn to Mark, the gospel that's the shortest and the one that we're named after. And the gospel of Mark, we're going to skip over a little bit. Last week we read from chapter 2, the first 12 verses about the paralytic. And it goes on from there to talk about Jesus calling Levi a tax collector, which really offended a lot of people because a tax collector was not a traditional kind of person that a religious leader would pick for their disciple. But Jesus calls him anyway. And then there's some a couple of incidences when Jesus and their disciples are challenged because they're not doing things according to the tradition of the Talmud, of, of the Torah. They're, they're doing things that are against the law and against the traditions of their religion. They aren't fasting. Um, they're not, uh, they're eating and, it's not that they're eating on the Sabbath, it's that they're plucking grain and then eating it on the Sabbath. And there have been lots and lots of rules that had been created around the idea of a Sabbath and what's work and what's not work. And the plucking of the grain was considered work. But Jesus each time rebuffs the religious leaders and basically has this attitude that we're going to talk about um, that tradition and laws, are they as important as other things? When does tradition and when does the law need to be put aside when well let's hear from chapter 3 where Jesus has another incident Jesus entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand they watched him to see whether he would cure the man on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him they being sort of the religious leaders and the people who were like protective of tradition. Jesus said to the man who had a withered hand, come forward. And then he said to them, to these people watching him, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill it? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved for their hard-heartedness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. The Pharisees went out immediately and conspired with the Herodians against Jesus to destroy him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I hope that you're cozy up someplace. I hope that you've got a blanket and I'm warm and, and have something warm to drink. It's been such a cold and, uh, oh my gosh, cold, snowy week. Um, it's just even hate going outside anymore. It's to that place where I'm really into the huga thing of staying in, staying cozy, um, keeping drinking the hot cocoa and coffee. And getting through the winter. Huga in the Scandinavian countries is sort of the expression, um, the attitude of coziness and comfort and sort of withdrawing into personal retreat, personal um, quiet time to read or to connect with small groups of family and friends during the long winter months of the very extreme northern European areas. 
And it's from these areas that we get our traditions that some of us have in North American Christianity of lighting candles and having um, the light be so meaningful to us. Because in those countries where it's very dark um, during the winter and very cold during the winter and you're staying inside, candles are very meaningful. We all have traditions that are meaningful to us. And for us in North America, having brought those, our ancestors having brought those traditions from Northern Europe of lighting candles and sort of uh, decorating our homes with the pine trees during the winter to bring new life and symbolism, those are very meaningful to us. But did you know that not all Christians like candles? And not all Christians celebrate Christmas with a Christmas tree. There are lots of places. In fact, probably the majority of Christianity doesn't like candles. Because that came from a particular culture um, and a particular type of living in which candles were meaningful. It was a meaningful tradition that has been passed down with generation to generation of people who also live in cold climates like Iowa. But that tradition doesn't translate very well to Africa or the Philippines or South America. There are lots of places where candles are a sign of witchcraft, not a sign of faith. When I lived in Africa and I talked about Advent, they had never heard of it before. I said, don't you like candles for Advent? They said, candles? We don't like candles in the church. That would be witchcraft. And I was astonished. I had no idea. Traditions often come from our culture, from the life that we live, the kind of environment that we live in. They're not always necessarily straight from the scripture. And when Jesus is interacting with the people that usually we see as like the bad guys in the Bible, the Pharisees, we have to remember that they were people who saw themselves as very faithful, very um, bound to to help uphold the traditions and the laws of their people. They weren't intending to be the mean bad guys of scripture. Nobody ever intends to be the mean bad guy in the story of their life or the story of that other people tell. But they loved traditions. They loved the law. They loved the scripture. And they felt that above all, we, the Jewish people, should be following those traditions and following those laws in order to live a kind life, the kind of life that God wants them to live. But Jesus sees that sometimes the tradition and the law gets in the way of a different moral of love and human need and compassion. Not always, but sometimes. And so Jesus confronts the Pharisees and challenges them to say, you know, what is most important? What really is the Sabbath supposed to be about? That law about keep the Sabbath holy. How many of us keep a Sabbath? How many of us put all work away? Don't even do laundry or don't catch up on mail or don't do any work for one day? I bet not many of us do. The Sabbath 
was so important and continues to be so important to our Jewish siblings because it is a reminder that we can't do everything, that we are reliant on God and we are reliant on trusting that God is in control and the world will go on without us for one day. And it gives opportunity for connection with family and connection to God. I had a Sabbath dinner in Israel with a Jewish family, and they, they told us how much they love the Sabbath because it's a time of quiet, a time of putting away phones, all electronics. They prepare their food ahead of time, so all they have to do is take it out of the uh, the refrigerator and eat it. Everything is done so that you can just embrace scripture, embrace time together, embrace just the simple quiet things in life. The Sabbath is a great thing. The Sabbath is a wonderful thing. And Jesus isn't saying that the Sabbath isn't a good in the world or that people shouldn't honor the Sabbath. But when he enters the synagogue and he sees this man who has a withered hand, Jesus has a choice. He could tell the guy, hey, I'll heal you tomorrow. Or he could do it now. Jesus says to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save life or to kill. In other words, Jesus is trying to point them to what is the greatest good? What is the greatest moral that we as people of faith live our lives by? Is the Sabbath a law to be followed only because it's a rule and a law? Or does the Sabbath point to a greater good and sometimes that greater good breaks the law of the Sabbath. This is one of the few times in scripture where it actually says Jesus was angry. God was angry and God was grieved. Jesus was grieved at their hardness of heart. Because they couldn't see that the law of the Sabbath was getting in the way of the purpose of the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath is to give life, right? To savor life, to do good to people, to give people a break, and to help people to enjoy God and connection and life. All they could see was the tradition and the law that said you can't do anything on the Sabbath. And Jesus was angry at them and frustrated with them because here's a person in need. And giving that person in need life, healing, wholeness, was just as important as keeping the Sabbath. A Sabbath where we enjoy a break and healing and wholeness. In this story and in all these stories, the previous stories in Mark chapter 2, are wrestling with the idea of what is the greatest good? Traditions and laws or immediate human needs? compassion, offering healing and goodness. Jesus sides with compassion, with helping the person who is withered, who is hurt and needs healing. Jesus sides with people that need to eat. And who cares if they plucked it on the Sabbath? They were hungry. They need life. Give them something to eat. Jesus sides 
with human needs and human compassion more than the rules. And that's, I think, where a lot of us can get caught up and stumble. Because all of us like certain rules. Even us liberals who think that, you know, being liberal means that uh, we don't like rules or we bend the rules. But we get used to our things that are things that we really like. Our traditions, our ways, our hymns, our patterns of worship, our ways of doing things. And sometimes we don't even notice how insisting on our own way and our own traditions gets in the way of ministering to someone in need, like the man with the withered hand. When I was in Okaboji, I went to a, a political meeting. I'll let you guess which uh, party it was. But I was by far the youngest person at this meeting for a county pol politics meeting. And everybody else was way past retirement age. And as they sat there and lamented the fact that there's no young people at the meeting, except for me and a couple other people who were looking at each other like, can they not see us? Did we turn invisible? <laughs> and then after lamenting that there's no young people at the meeting, the person in charge said, well, I guess everybody just has to keep their own jobs that they've had for years because there's nobody to pass them off to. So keep doing it. Here's the thing. If you don't like the result, why do you keep doing things the way you're doing them? Because you're always going to get what you already got if you keep doing it the same. If we want a different result, if we want more young people, you have to change the way you're doing things. The church has for 20, 30 years, all over Christianity in America, North America especially, Christianity has been going down. And there's been huge debates and fights over traditional worship versus praise worship and all these different kinds of things. Let me ask, has keeping and doing what we've always done resulted in a church that's full of kids and families? If not, do we need to change our traditions and embrace new ways? What good is it to keep a tradition, to keep traditional ways of doing things, and then the church dies because the next generation doesn't participate? The purpose of traditions and the good thing about traditions is that they can connect us across generations and certain things that are meaningful from generation to generation get kept because they point us to a larger community, a community beyond time and space, a community that we are a part of. When we light candles on Christmas Eve or when we say the Lord's Prayer together, we are part of a larger community that goes around the world. But if the next generation is missing and isn't participating, then are our traditions doing what we want them to do? Or have they simply become preferences and we've become hard-hearted because we want our preferences to win, regardless of the fact that there are people who are in need. 
There are people who are all over in need of Jesus, who have withered hearts, withered lives, withered hands. And they are yearning for community, for acceptance, for forgiveness, for grace, all the things that the church can offer. Why aren't they here? Why aren't they showing up? What is it that we've insisted on keeping doing that's prevented people from coming and from being healed and experiencing the love of Jesus? It's not an easy question. And it's really hard to wrestle with those things. One of my favorite musicals of all time is Fiddler on the Roof. In fact, I was the female lead in my high school version of Fiddler in the Roof, Spencer High School, 1994. And little known fact for Valentine's Day, my spouse, Stuart, he also was the lead in his high school versions of Fiddler on the Roof. And so he was Tevya, I was Golda. We, were, uh, we both played a married couple different years, different schools, but one of the first things that we found out about each other on our first date was that we both had starred in Fiddler on the Roof, and that's always been our favorite musical. And one of the songs that starts the musical is the song Tradition, Tradition. And the whole musical centers around Tevye's love for his faith, love for his traditions, love for his way of life, love for his community, and the way that they do things has kept them a close community. But his daughters don't appreciate the traditions of matchmaking, and they want to do things a different way. And Tevye wrestles really hard because those traditions are important to him. He experienced them and they're important to the community and they're important to their whole way of life. But because he loves his daughters, because he loves, he is able to overcome tradition to an openness of heart that allows his daughters to find a new way of life. Jesus is inviting us to a similar thing, to say to ourselves, our church, to our, our nation, hey, what are the ways that we've been doing things that may be traditional and may have worked at one time and place in our history, but they're not working for everybody now. Our health system, our political system, our economic system, they worked at one time, but not for everyone. And there are people that are hurting and people that are hungry and people that aren't getting the health care they need. Are we going to hold on to our traditions or are we going to hold on to the greatest good of loving our neighbor as ourself? I hope that this Valentine's Day you choose love and that you challenge yourself to ask yourself, what am I willing to give up? What traditions am I willing to break in the name of love? In the name of love, can I be okay with changes to our political system, changes to our health system, changes in our schools and, and our education. Can I be okay with changes in the church? In the name of love, can we be like Jesus who challenges us? Are you ready to heal and love somebody on the Sabbath, even if it breaks the rule. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin can 
The time is coming soon when we will worship together again, when we will again be in God's sanctuary. But no matter where we are, no matter where we worship, no matter what music, what style, no matter what we're wearing, or whether we're in person or watching on television, the Spirit is at work in us. And where our heart is connected to God, is our sanctuary. And so go knowing that you are continually in the presence of God and you are not alone. God loves you and God's peace be upon you. Amen. St. Mark's. Today is Sunday, February 14th, a day that we celebrate the people we love and remember those in our heart. Today's special offering is for the Emma Nugent Memorial Scholarship, an annual scholarship awarded to a City High senior who embodied Emma's characteristics of a positive attitude, leadership, and enthusiasm for community service. As you know, Emma Nugent, daughter of Joe and Carmen Nugent, was a lifelong member of St. Mark's and a very active member of our youth group. The Emma Nugent Memorial Scholarship was set up to honor her legacy. It will provide a monetary award to one senior each year based on an essay submission. Our goal is to remember all that she gave us through her laughter, her service to St. Mark's, and the joy she brought to everything that she did. It is our goal that Emma's spirit of service will live on through the scholarship fund and those who receive it. Your contribution will help ensure her impact will endure and give us the opportunity to continue to celebrate Emma's life. Please make any checks payable to the Emma Nugent Memorial Scholarship. Thank you so much for your support. Mm -hmm. 